Right, now we can start the lecture two uh, in this course unit, uh, the, which is focusing on manufacturing of polymetric composites actually. So this is the part one. So there'll be another lecture for the manufacturing of uh, the polymer matrix composites. So uh, here, what I'm going to do now, so we're going to look at uh, the manufacturing of uh, the polymer matrix composites, metal matrix composites and ceramic matrix composites. So then I'm going to start with uh, the polymer matrix composites. So then after that, we can look at the, the metal matrix and the ceramic matrix composites uh, the accordingly, right? So here in this lecture, I'm going to look at uh, the number of different techniques uh, that are used to manufacture polymer matrix composites. Uh, so here, hand layup, spray up, injection molding, compression molding, sheet molding, compound, uh, the reinforced reaction injection molding, structural reaction injection molding. Actually, some of these uh, the manufacturing techniques for polymetric composites could be really simple. So here, I'm not going to cover all the uh, processes, all the techniques in the same capacity. So I'll be looking at some processes into the basic level. For example, so I would tell you uh, the main processing steps, the materials being used to, uh, to manufacture the products, and then uh, the main advantages and disadvantages related to the process, uh, the components that are used, and also the applications for the, the products being manufactured using that technique. For some processes, I'll be looking into more detail. For example, injection molding, we can look at the cooling time required to manufacture some particular part. So, so in the second lecture of the polymetric composites, I'm going to look at the resin trans molding process. In that process, I'm going to go into detail to model the flow behavior. So likewise, so for different processes, I'll be looking at uh, a very basic level for some processes. So I'll be providing some uh, the details into the process, uh, the processing mechanisms and the processing phenomena or the modeling of the flow behavior and so on, right? So then these are the expected learning outcomes uh, the, uh, for this lecture number two. So you should have some understanding of the basics of uh, the polymetric composites and then likewise. So then at the end of the lecture, you should have a kind of good understanding on the concept that we discussed uh, within this lecture, okay? And here also, I would like to encourage you to uh, read more materials relating to the manufacturing of polymetric composites. And uh, the, I have uploaded some of the useful uh, the reading materials on the Blackboard. You can read them. If any of you are interested more on the, uh, the specific technique or specific material, so there'll be lots of material outside you can read. And then we always encourage you to read extra materials uh, for all the topics that we are covering in this unit. Right, so let's start with the uh, polymetric composite. So then I would like to start with the kind of very basic overview of the uh, polymetric composites. So then we can get into the other manufacturing techniques relating to the polymetric composites. Okay, then let's make a start by looking at the possible, uh, the matrix materials for polymetric composites actually. So as we know, we can classify the polymeric materials into a few different ways or few different uh, the categories. So here we know that we can classify the materials as thermoplastic materials and thermoset materials. Okay, so here you can see some of the, uh, the thermoplastic materials or the thermoplastic nature is that, so we can just uh, the, heat the material and then uh, we can shape the material by heating. And then after that, so once you just form that material into a shape, we can reheat and uh, the reshape that material into a different shape. So therefore we can process the thermoplastic material a few different times into different shapes uh, the, without any problem. So then it is a kind of recyclable material compared to the thermoset materials. So here you can see some of the common examples for the uh, thermoplastic materials, uh, which are common in the current industry. So you could see nylon, polycarbonate, uh, and then polyethylenes, uh, the polypropylene and so on. In here also, we can classify the thermoplastic materials into two other groups again, as amorphous materials and crystalline materials. For example, here you would see like uh, the polyethylenes, they are crystalline materials, uh, but uh, the polystyrene is a type of amorphous materials. Okay, let's look at what the difference between these two types as well. And the other important parameter is that the processing window of a given material. For example, we could say most of the thermoplastic materials, we can process them between uh, the 200 to uh, the, the 350 or so, but actually this depends on the material. Uh, let's consider the polyethylene family, for example. So I could say that the polyethylene can be processed in between uh, the 180 degrees to 250 degrees, for example. So, but again, you have to understand here, there are so many grades of polyethylene materials in the market. So therefore, depending on the grade, so we have to decide the suitable processing window or processing range for a given material. So this is something you have to look at with the melting temperature of a given material or the glass transition temperature of an amorphous material, right? The processing temperature is a really important parameter for a given material. So we have to understand 
what is the most suitable processing temperature or the processing temperature range for given material uh, depending on their properties uh, so you can check that uh, through some experimental trials or you might be just given those information by the materials manufacturer uh, from their data sheets as well and also we can classify the polymeric materials as amorphous semicrystalline or crystalline solid so based on that also we have to consider number of parameters when we process those materials okay then let's try to look at the main differences between these amorphous and crystalline materials for the amorphous materials we normally discuss something called glass transition temperature so those materials will not undergo any clear phase change process while we heat them or during the processing what will happen is the as we add the heat to the material the material will simply just uh, the change the state from glass state to rubbery state okay so we can represent that behavior using this simple graph here. So you can see this is the heat. We add the heat at the same time, the temperature goes up. So at a certain temperature, so the material will change from glass state. So this is the state of glass state or the hard state or the solid-like behavior. Material will just uh, the transform from solid-like behavior to the, uh, the, the rubbery-like behavior at a certain temperature, which is known as the glass transform temperature. Okay, so therefore we have to make sure that so when you process the amorphous material, we should process a temperature which is higher than the, uh, the glass transfer temperature, okay? So otherwise, we cannot uh, the shape the material into the desired shape or we might not uh, achieve the required flowability of the material if you try to process the material in somewhere here, which is less than uh, the glass transfer temperature of that particular material, okay? So, but however, for the semicrystalline materials, though as we just uh, add the heat, what will happen that the polymer chains uh, pull out from their structure, and then we can see a clear uh, the phase change process for the semicrystalline material. Okay, so that behavior can be explained by using this simple sketch here. So again, we add the heat at the same time, the temperature will go up. Okay, so this is the, the solid state. So then at some point or at certain temperature, so material will start to just uh, the change from solid state to liquid state, right? So then uh, this is the related, uh, the part for that particular, uh, the phase change process actually. So, so this temperature is known as uh, the melting temperature of that particular material or a crystalline material. But if, uh, as you can observe from this curve, so you had to provide some amount of heat to change the material state from the solid to uh, the, the uh, liquid state or to the molten state. So this amount of heat is known as the latent heat of fusion of a given material, okay? So this could be common for any material which are having a phase change process from solid state to liquid state. So the amount of energy required to transform a material from solid state to liquid state is known as the latent heat of fusion, okay? So this could be different from uh, different material depending on the strength of the structure. Okay, so but here you can understand now for the amorphous materials and semicrystalline materials, we can see some kind of uh, the clear uh, the difference uh, uh, in their behavior during the processing. Uh, for the amorphous material, there is no clear phase change process. The material is simply just uh, the, uh, the transform from glass state to rubbery state. So that is the region we can process the material. So then we have to make sure to have a temperature which is higher than the glass transition temperature during the processing of the material. Uh, for the semicrystalline materials, we should uh, always select the temperature uh, greater than the melting temperature during the processing of those materials, okay? So therefore, those are really important. If you, if you try to process the material somewhere here, there could be some problems because there could be some unmelted particle in the melt. So uh, always we should uh, think about the melting temperature when we select the suitable, uh, the processing window or the temperature range for a given material. So that is why, so we have a number of different grades of different materials. So when we just try to process those materials, we have to carefully observe uh, the properties of those materials. And then we have to carefully select the required processing, uh, the parameters. Okay, for example, we should select something uh, the above the melting temperature, but not something even uh, the extremely high temperature so then material can degrade. Okay, so uh, the processing window is a really important uh, parameter uh, during the processing of a material. Otherwise, there could be some degradation of the material that could be chemical or thermal degradation of the material. So therefore, the selection of the proper processing conditions are really important factor, uh, especially when we process the, uh, the polymeric materials. Hope now you understand the main difference between the amorphous and crystalline materials. For the amorphous materials, we discuss a glass transition temperature. Uh, and then for the uh, crystalline materials, we discuss a melting temperature because it has a clear phase change process as we add heat to process the material. Okay.
Therefore, it is really important to understand that material can behave differently uh, depending on the processing temperature that you're going to select. For example, for the amorphous materials uh, below and above TG, the behavior of the materials are completely different. So therefore, that is an important parameter to consider. For the semicrystalline material, the melting temperature is the main point. So then when you select the processing temperature, so you have to consider the melting temperature. If you don't consider those temperatures uh, while you process the material, so you might not get the required, uh, the processing conditions or required properties from the product that you're going to manufacture. On the other hand, the degree of crystallinity is also important during the processing of material. Okay, when you select the, the matrix materials for some given composite material, so we have to consider the degree of crystallinity of that material as well. For example, let's consider the polyethylene family. So we, so we have three main different types of polyethylenes, linear low density polyethylene, uh, the low density polyethylene and high density polyethylene. Okay, of these three main uh, the types, the most commonly used uh, the polyethylene, uh, the type for polymetric composites is the high density polyethylene. So, but why? So then there's a reason for that. So the degree of crystallinity is one of the important parameter in that aspect actually. So therefore, when you select some suitable material for manufacturing some particular product, it could be uh, uh, the composite material or something else. So you have to consider the chemical, mechanical, thermal, rheological properties of those type of materials. So then only we can decide the most suitable material for a given applications. So let's try to look at uh, the behavior of the polyethylene family uh, or the properties of the polyethylene family uh, based on their density, melt flow index or the crystallinity here. I just try to show you like uh, some properties of the polyethylene family. Right, if you look at the LDP material, you see here, right, the, the LDP, the density is normally uh, the between 0 0.9 to 0 0.925, okay? Okay, this is the structure, this is the backbone of the carbon. I hope you know about the, uh, the structure of the polymers. It has a long chain carbon uh, backbone. Okay, so uh, the, it has both long chains and short chain branches here in this structure. Okay, the degree of crystallinity is less than 50% mostly. So that is why we call it low density polyethylene. Okay, so uh, the, that is the only, only polyethylene material which is having long chain, long chain branches. Okay, in this structure. So then if you try to look at uh, the compare with high density polyethylene, you can see the density is roughly 0 0.941 maybe, 940, and no long chain branches. Degree of crystallinity is greater than 70%. The one thing you have to just understand, so we, we discuss about a parameter called melt flow index. When you try to mix some uh, material or reinforcement with the polymers, okay, let's say this one is just uh, the 20 grams per 10 minutes. So you can measure this uh, the parameter, interesting. 20 grams for 10 minutes. If you try to mix with some uh, the reinforcement, let's say short fiber or some powder, so this is going to decrease quite significantly. Maybe it becomes half, maybe. Okay. So therefore, this is a parameter how uh, the ability of material to flow. Okay. So therefore, when you mix uh, the, some reinforcement with these polymers, so this value will go down. So that means it is a problem to flow it through the flow alone. The channels of the, uh, the mold, mold when, you, when you process it. So therefore, so therefore, that is why we have different grades of material for extrusion, injection molding, <coughs> thermoforming, and then depending on uh, the manufacturing method, so we have to use different grades of thermoplastics, okay? So that is why we have so many grades. We call injection grade, extrusion grade. When, if you're going to buy material, they'll ask, okay, do you want injection molding grade or extrusion grade? And then we know then which MFI is important. And then if you try to um, buy some material for uh, uh, manufacturing of composites, this is one thing. Always you try to use some high melt flow index material, uh, possibly because uh, then it is going to reduce the melt flow index when you mix it with some reinforcement. Okay. So these things are not that easy. You have to just uh, study these materials before choosing some material for practical application. Then uh, the linear low density polyethylene, yeah. it also has no long chain branches. Degree of crystallinity is roughly around 40%. <coughs> the density range, you can see that. Okay, so this is a comparison of uh, these three type of materials in the polyethylene family. So you have to know these properties or even more than this when you pick materials for some applications.
Okay, so uh, if I try to provide some comparison in a table, so uh, the this says uh, the long chain branches per thousand backbone carbon. Okay, so if you look at the carbon uh, the backbone, right? So for the LDP, so uh, the long long chain branches roughly one four thousand carbons in the in the backbone. Okay, and then HDP and LD, LLDP, they don't have any long chain branches. And short chain, uh, the, for the LDP, 15 to 30, 4,000 carbons. High density polyethylene up to 10. Right, and so on, we can compare the material. So, these, you have to look at these properties when you choose materials uh, for uh, applications. It could be composite manufacturing or any other, still you have to know these properties. Okay? Normally, thermo, uh, the plastic materials are not good in high, te high, high temperature applications. Uh, the, but the processing temperature, the processing temperature for thermoplastics are a bit higher than the thermosets. Okay? Processing temperature, so I was just, I was talking about the processing temperature for polyethylene here. Okay? So then this is a thermoplastic material, the polyurethane is a thermoset material, so we might process this in a wide range, maybe up to 25 to 80 degrees. So you could see now, the processing temperature is lower. Initially, thermosets uh, have low viscosity, okay, so low viscosity, right? Initially it has low viscosity and we can process at low temperatures and HDP or maybe thermoplastics, high processing temperatures. Right, uh, the but what will happen with these thermoset materials? Due to the reactions, they will become more brittle after manufacturing. Okay, they tend to be more brittle due to the reaction. They become more stronger, but they become more brittle as well. So that means the toughness is going to be less than the thermoplastics. I Therefore, because they are more brittle and they are more susceptible to or maybe they are more tend to be having cracks the brittle nature of this structure will produce more cracks okay so compared to the thermoplastics right uh, the but okay so thermosets are good in high temperature applications in general but uh, these uh, the thermoplastic materials like peak recently developed they are also good now for high temperature applications so lots of research going on, maybe some of you, you might use peak material in your projects. The thermosets, uh, ex examples here, initially they have very low viscosity. We can process them in low temperatures. And uh, the main thing we know is the cross-linking reaction during the processing. So it could be complicated reactions you can study. We're going to look at maybe one or two reactions later. Okay, no, uh, we are not going to discuss the chemistry in this module, but we can look at maybe one, two chemical reactions for polyurethane maybe. Okay, uh, it's irreversible reaction. Okay, so we know the curing should be done by heating, during the heating. For the thermoplastic materials, the solidification occurs while cooling. For the thermosets, we have to heat it up during the curing uh, of the solidification. The, the cross-linking, uh, it will just prevent the movement of the molecular chains after curing. So then therefore that is why it is difficult to reprocess them. Okay, it's a permanent reaction. The cross-link will just try to tie down or the, uh, tie up the chains uh, so tightly. So therefore they can't move after the, after the curing reaction. So that is one of the main reasons we can't reprocess them. But thermoplastic material, we can heat it up and then reform into another shape, okay? Uh, so, so many properties are there, so if you try to compare different materials now, uh, the processing temperature for the thermosets is quite uh, the low compared to thermoplastics, and processing time, so because we discussed right now, uh, the chain reaction takes a bit more time. So then, uh, processing time is low for the thermoplastic compared to thermosets, because thermosets for the curing time for the reaction, and the user temperatures, the cross-linking structures will provide more tough uh, the, the surface, okay? But it's brittle, I told you before. 
So therefore, we can use it for uh, the the uh, high temperature applications. High, but you have to understand what I mean. High temperature is a really weak word, weak phrase. High temperature means okay, if you if you compare about the ceramics, high temperature mean I mean 2000 degrees maybe. Okay, here high temperature mean maybe 300 200 degrees. Okay, so you have to understand. So I don't like to use this phrase. Uh, it's better or high temperature or is superior than this. But you have to be specific. For the polymers, you might use it for 300 to 400 maybe even maybe not that much. Metals 7 to 800. Ceramics maybe about thousand, so that is what I mean by high. Okay, so it depends on the material type. Okay, and the toughness of the thermosets are low because they become more brittle. What is the definition of the toughness? Toughness is the energy a material can absorb before failure or fracture. Yes. So then, so they tend to be more stretchy thermoplastics compared to thermosets. Thermoset material, you can easily break it. Maybe they will break without much deformation. So therefore, the, uh, the toughness is low for uh, the thermoset material compared to thermoplastics. Okay? So this is mostly the answer is the, uh, the cross-linking reaction. So they try to block the molecules, uh, chain molecule chains, so they can't move them. So therefore, they can't have some deformation. Okay? Right. Uh, tend to be bitter. So comparisons. Uh, thermoplastics, we discussed already thermosets and then so many uh, the good and bad points, pros and cons. So uh, you can study here. Okay. Uh, thermoplastics, high impact resistance, surpa good surface finish, recycling, no emissions, but no emission means it doesn't mean there are some emissions. Okay. So uh, we have to be careful on those things when you process. If you work in plastic industry, this could be cancer causing. Like especially something like styrene material is really uh, the cancer causing material. If you work over there for a long time, these, uh, the volatile gases are really dangerous, could be toxic and co can cause cancers. No emission means it has less emission compared to thermosets. Like when you process polyurethane, so then it could be more smelly, okay, and could be fumes, and then you have to take some actions for those things, okay. Uh, and uh, cons, uh, for the thermoplastics, you could say, it will just expose to high temperature, it could remelt. It melt. Okay, but uh, thermosets might not be melting or remelting again that easily because the irreversible reaction. Uh, so, please, uh, the, there are so many uh, things to discuss here. Uh, you can just uh, list down these things uh, by reading some extra materials as well. Right. Then, reinforcements, as I said, this is just only a few, not all the reinforcements available. Glass fibers, uh, the carbon fibers, cavalous, so then these are long fibers that we can use. Okay? Uh, and then short fibers, glass bead, carbon bead, the rubber, particles, or even liquid foam, and then silicon carbide, alumina, graphite, graphene oxide, eggshells, uh, uh, the nuts. Okay? So there are so many things. Banana skins. Okay? So there, there could be so many things you can test. Now you are looking for biodegradable material, so therefore you can test new reinforcements. Okay, uh, so then uh, the the main function of the fibers, the fibers. Okay, so it's quite uh, uh, the knowledge that you have already to carry the applied load. So that is why we want to have a reinforcement. That is the concept of the composites as well. So we want to produce some material with more uh, the functional properties with more strength ideally okay to carry the stiffness or the provide the functional properties a stiffness maybe conductivity or insulation properties we don't know so whatever the properties that you want so you choose the reinforcement sometimes you won't have conductive polymers so then you use some reinforcement with conductive properties okay so then fibers will provide the functional properties as well thermal stability or maybe isotropic properties in all the directions and so on you decide so these are the the, the main functions of the fibers in a composite uh, the main function of the matrix material so of, of course uh, the matrix material is just bind or keep the fibers together to form the structure okay and then provide the rigidity and also protect the fibers from environment or any other chemical hazards or wind things. Yeah. So ideally, so those are the things. So it would be better to uh, know about 
these functional properties of the matrix and uh, the, the uh, fibers in composite materials. Okay, and the other thing, uh, the so many materials available, so when you manufacture the composites, you have to know about the compatibility between the resin material and the fiber. The compatibility means, so they should go together. You know that sometimes, some people, they, they are not compatible with each other. Okay, so then we can't just uh, the put them together. So that, for example now, let's say one reinforcement is not adding to or sticking with the, the matrix, so then no use. We can't use those two together, isn't it? So no point. So therefore compatibility is important, that is one thing. Maybe sometimes we want to have some chemical reactions, sometimes may not be. So therefore we have to check the compatibility of the resin and matrix material when you use them. Um, that is why so properties are important here. So you have to know these things. And there are several other things to discuss, decide type of applications, cost factors, the manufacturing techniques, okay, uh, the, uh, the economical manufacturing. So you don't need to just put uh, lots of fibers if it is a really low uh, strength applications. It's a waste of money and no waste of resources as well. Okay, so why the polymer matrix composites are better? You could see now specific modulus and specific strength. So polyethylene is here and so so many uh, the other uh, reinforcements used in uh, polymer matrix are good in specific modulus. Okay, so you can see the definition for these words. These are quite well known. And carbon fiber reinforcement, uh, reinforced plastics, top in the, the, the here in the, in the right hand uh, corner, specific modulus, specific strength. That is why the pioneering material uh, to be in aerospace industry. So, uh, it's a quite familiar chart for you in the material selection exercise last, uh, last semester. So, strength and density. So, these are the polymers, but with composites, we can just push it up. So to have high strength, okay. So it, it has new properties, and so we improve the properties, right? So again, stiffness. Uh, the composites can come to the stiffness of metals and ceramics. Uh, uh, the when we manufacture the composite material. So is, is strength values, specific strength, tensile strength, they are better, okay. So applications the market, USA and Europe, so uh, the, you can look into them, right. That's